Hey, welcome everybody. This is going to be a really, really interesting conversation. I am super excited about this. We're talking about the use of AI in the context of research, and in particular in the context of lit review and systematic lit review. We've got exactly the right people in the room. Uh, so if you're if you've just arrived, lean back. This is going to be one of the most interesting conversations you've heard of, you've watched and heard in a long time. And we're going to start off as I introduce the panel members. We're going to start off with some uh, some sort of interesting questions. I'm going to ask them. I'm going to, I'm going to start with you, uh, Kevin. In one sentence, sort of introduce yourself. Who are you? And answer the question: Do you think that there's going to be people who, in the future, don't have jobs, or there are going to be fewer jobs in the space that they work because of the advent of AI? Over to you, Kevin. Thanks so much, Greg. I'm Kevin Kalmus. I'm the founder and CEO of Nested Knowledge, an AI company dedicated to systematic review and meta analysis. And uh, in answer to your question, I grew up in a household of radiologists, and we have been hearing since basically the late 80s that imaging is going to be the first place that AI is going to take over. And I think that with some of the advances we're seeing right now um, mm -hmm. with, with the current AI models, we're finally going to see some of that promise come through. I don't think there will be no radiologists, but I certainly think that there are a lot of radiology tasks that are going to fall off their plate. Yeah, absolutely agree. And I think we're already starting to see that. And just to extend on that, because I, I, I'm a medical doctor, so I think about that exact question quite a lot. I think the same principle is going to apply across a lot of different uh, professions within the medical medical fraternity that involve looking at something. So radiology is a good example, but microbiology is another one. Uh, you know, uh, pathology is another one. There's lots and lots of examples in the medical profession where you need to look at something and make a decision. And that's an easy use case for AI in many different contexts. Okay, next, Riaz. Riaz, again, in one sentence, if you could tell us who you are and answer the question, how is it that AI is impacting on the way we do research at the moment? Hi, thank you. Uh, so my name is um, Dr. Riaz Kreshi. I'm a senior methodologist uh, with Pico Portal and an assistant professor of ophthalmology and epidemiology at the University of Colorado. Um, definitely AI's being used in research quite a lot now, and we're seeing the way that it's being utilized changing uh, every day, it seems. Um, in the systematic review space, especially right now, you know, for, for years, it's already, or for the last couple of years, it's been uh, more and more utilized in the searching um, aspect. And I think it's going to be utilized more and more in data extraction and hopefully in summarizing eventually once the capacities uh, get bigger. But right now in research, where we're seeing a lot of it right now, I think used is in the writing aspect. Um, if you can give it stuff, give it facts to work with um, and help refine your writing, that's better than asking it to come up with things on its own. Yeah, yeah. Exciting times. Thanks very much, Riaz. Okay, over to Jeff. Jeff, Jeff Meister, uh, if that's really you, Jeff, and not some uh, deep fake. Uh, yep. Jeff, if you can tell us in a sentence who you are, and here's my question for you. How might AI change the way research is being is, is done in the future? So Riaz talked about what's happening now. What does the future look like? How are things going to change? What is the world we're leaning into going forwards? Yeah, my name is Jeff Johnson, Chief Design Officer at Nested Knowledge. Um, my answer to this question is is somewhat uh, twofold. First of all, I would say that research has been, even prior to the advent of AI, and will be an act of curation uh, more so than than ever before. There's already too much information out there, right? There's a there's a there's more systematic reviews. There are more meta analyses. There are more, you know, published uh, clinical works of literature than ever before, and that pace uh, is rapidly accelerating. Right, it continues to 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 grow every year. So, in order to fully make sense of that body of literature, um, AI is almost going to become necessary. Um, and, and it's sort of the the second part of my answer is that it's 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 almost more of a an effect of having too much information in the world than it is a a a, a cause of you know job loss or, or anything else right i think it's it's more so about figuring out how do we as a human species make sense of the 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 vast sea of data that we that we swim in every day yeah <laughs> i think I, I can relate to the vast sea of data just my email inbox feels like i need an ai to take control of it some days uh, thanks very much jeff um and then last but not least um etan I wonder if you could introduce yourself in a sentence and tell us, you know, uh, Kevin talked about what jobs might be at risk going forwards, but might it not also be true that going forwards because of the advent of AI, there are going to be new and interesting jobs and career opportunities 
uh, perhaps ones that we can think of and perhaps ones that we can't think of. But could you just address that um, in one or two sentences? Of course. <laughs> so thank you. So I'm Eitan Agai. I'm the founder of Pico Portal, started Pico Portal uh, during the pandemic. Uh, actually, my background is in the AI and the financial world. And during the pandemic, I brought this technology to help researchers to do better research. So um, I've seen it in, in Wall Street, and I think that it's true over here as well. Uh, definitely changed the way that we are doing work today. And I would encourage everyone that is listening right now to, to start practicing with AI because we do need to start training our brain muscles to, yeah. you know, to think that way. But um, if history teaches us anything, uh, absolutely it will create new jobs and some jobs will disappear. It happened during the era when uh, microcomputers were introduced and, 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 yep. and cell phones and all of those things are uh, really disruptive technologies and we do need to embrace ourselves. I don't, I think that the jobs that will disappear are those that are not making use of the technology. Those yeah. that will stay will have to change the process that they're doing, whatever they're doing, but it's definitely yeah. uh, is going to change and will create new jobs. Uh, it's a totally different mindset when you use an AI uh, from experience. I, I, I love the old adage, um, AI is not gonna take your job but somebody who knows how to work with AI might. Uh, and so, you know, the onus is on us, as you say, to flex those muscles. Um, I was I was telling th this panel yesterday when we just connected in that I use uh, GPT-4 in the evenings to make up new little stories for my kids, like bedtime story reading. And every night I am blown away by what, you know, what, 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 it, what gets produced. But it is interesting that the better you get at creating prompts, uh, you know, the more you get out of whatever it is you're trying to do with it. In my case, not deep science, it's kind of a story about a teddy bear, but you know, the applications fall everywhere. Um, just a quick note to everybody, there is a Q&A button that you should be able to see on your screen. Click on that if you've got a question, pop it into the Q&A. Uh, during the call, we will try and address questions as they come up, but certainly toward the end of the meeting, we'll lean into that heavily and try and address, we might not get to everything, but we'll certainly try and pick out the sort of more poignant and interesting uh, questions. The other thing that if you're watching this on YouTube, because this, if you're not watching it live, you might be watching this in the future at some point on YouTube or LinkedIn or some other platform. We will make sure that there are links in the description that'll take you to Pico Portal and Nested Knowledge. So you can go and check out those platforms because you're going to see and hear a lot about them um, in the minutes to come. Okay, super duper. Let's jump right in. And the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to ask uh, Kevin and Jeff, if they can do a little demonstration of the application of AI with nested knowledge. And we'll start off with Kevin. Um, and Kevin, I think you're going to show us the use of GPT-4 in the context of extraction. So can I hand over to you to blow us away? Yes. Uh, uh, Eitan, if you could give screen sharing privileges uh, to me, that would be wonderful. But I can start talking to it right now. Uh, nested knowledge is a living uh, uh, evidence synthesis platform. So that is, you can complete systematic reviews and meta-analyses live online with AI assistance. Uh, Today is not really about that whole process, but I just wanted to present briefly what is involved in the uh, evidence synthesis process and then go directly into uh, how our AI works. So just a quick presentation here. We think that the systematic review process is very time intensive. It's generally you know, completed manually in Microsoft Excel. It takes a huge amount of time. And if you're working with collaborators, it can basically take 18 months and hundreds of thousands of dollars to, uh, to get these things out here. Uh, we think that living evidence is the solution, but you can't really get to living evidence without AI assistance uh, because it's simply an extra burden uh, to keep evidence constantly up to date. So uh, this knowledge as a platform is basically uh, a, a uh, two-part platform where you can do AI-assisted search, screening, and then extraction of qualitative and quantitative content, and then that helps create some interactive visuals. With all of that noted, and I know I'm going very fast, I mostly want to get us directly into the discussion, we do have several AI assistants that help you get to some of the visual outputs that are shown in the software here. You can see a sunburst diagram of some patient characteristics, interventions, and outcomes from a systematic review that I've completed on a, on a topic of interest to me, uh, which is neurointervention for, uh, for aneurysms. Um, Kevin, I'm presenting my screen. I don't know if Etan was able to give you access, but I can... Oh. I can maybe uh, go to a specific nest or something. I 
Are you guys not? I, I, I guess I failed to check. Are you guys able to see what I'm presenting here? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. 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 Uh, Never mind then. Yep. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> All good. I, I'll, I'll hand over to you in, in just one sec, Jeff, to show okay. some Great. of our AI tools. Uh, first, quickly, this is published online, so you can read up on this in more detail. But when it comes to MK and GPT, this layers on top of a couple other AI integrations, just to sort of give you a scope of how AI can be integrated into systematic review. In short, we think that AI can help you find your PICOs, so your patients, your interventions and comparators, and then your outcomes of interest. Those are generally going to be used in many, in pretty much any clinical systematic review. Uh, we have an AI, AI integration that helps you find those. I'm sure that you can, of course, uh, uh, find those elsewhere. I think that actually Pico Portal is a specialist in helping you find your Picos. We also help you bibliomine existing systematic reviews. And if you want to screen articles, we have an AI that you can set up as basically a, a AI quality control assistant, where you screen every article, the AI screens every article, and then you can see any disagreements. I think that some of these are common across uh, common use cases for AI across uh, systematic review. But one that we're very excited about and what I wanted to focus on today is uh, extracting evidence directly from full texts, because I think that is one of sort of these these uh, uh, challenges that we that was basically out of our uh, capabilities until quite recently. And with the advent of GPT, we all know that there have been some major problems. And I think Riaz is going to go into this in a lot more detail, but I'll give it the high level. We all have concerns about GPT with accuracy and with hallucination. So none of us want to see any hallucination by the AI uh, concerning what evidence might be relevant for a systematic review. This is medical science we're talking about. We can't simply take any any given thought that an AI has about a, a concept. Instead, what Jeff and his team have been working on is making what we call smart tag recommendations. And these smart tag recommendations are an application of GPT where we're narrowing it. We're only allowing it to extract evidence from the set of PDFs that are in your project. And then we also only allow it to ask the questions that you configure. So you set up the questions, you import the full text, and it is forced to give you an answer with a citation directly to the PDF. And so what does that look like in action? That means that any of these given uh, uh, concepts that were extracted from our aneurysm literature review, such as the shapes of the aneurysms, the rupture statuses, outcomes of interest, and even the therapies that were used, all of these are gathered with AI assistance uh, so again, you have to get past the search step. You have to have screened articles to those that are relevant. But once you've done so, you can jump into any underlying study, open up our smart tag recommendations, and all you need to do is click on them, and it should give you evidence, not just a statement, but evidence to support the concept of this device is present in this study. Uh, Post-operative platelet, uh, antiplatelet regimen, even though none of those words are stated in the uh, in the underlying PDF, that can be found by the AI and presented to you for confirmation. And so that, that way you get human oversight, but you also have the AI held accountable to finding the evidence in the underlying PDF rather than making up the evidence itself. Um, Jeff, I think that covers our current major GPT integration. And I will say we do have some accuracy uh, concerns, which is why we set this up with human oversight. So you're going to review every tag because just like any medical researcher, this can be wrong. But Jeff, I wanted you to discuss some futuristic use cases where it can be more than just wrong. So I'm going to give up screen share and throw it over to you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so, so yeah, so that's what's currently available in our platform. And because we're asking the the AI, the, the large language model, to simply identify concepts and then um, allowing the researcher to confirm or deny the accuracy of those uh, particular you know, suggestions by the LLM, that ensures a high level of accuracy. Um, so, so really you're using a generative language model to identify themes in text, and, and that's useful. But of course, generative models can also generate text as well. And so we're experimenting on our side with what that could look like. And internally, we're calling this R&D project, chat with your papers. The idea being, hey, can we pass uh, a large body of text to a generative model and then and then get it to make interesting uh you know summarizations of that text and i have to say it is pretty challenging to get it to 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 do so with any degree of accuracy gpt 3.5 and I, I think uh riaz will will talk a little bit about some of the differences uh later on in this webinar was okay and it it, it did it did fairly well at certain types of tasks GPT-4 gets a little bit better still, but we have a long ways to go when it comes to um, having sort of a human level of understanding uh, when it comes to making certain types of logical inferences 
and I have an example I can share with you. Um, can you see my screen? Can everyone see my screen? Yeah, yeah great. I just yep, yep. not used to Zoom too well. Okay, so um, here's here's a here's a demo nest with inside of nested knowledge. Um, this is this is that same demo nest that uh, that Kevin was showing you. Actually, no, it's a different one. Um, this is a heart failure demo nest. There are nine included studies. Uh, they have not been tagged yet, right? So the idea is, okay, can I parse the text from the, these PDFs and can I make sense of them? Can I ask the LLM to answer questions on them? And to some extent, the answer is 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 yes. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm to asking, uh, I'm, I'm conducting two tasks. I'm parsing the PDF and generating a series of embeddings. In other words, I'm saying, for each of these words or each of these parts of these words, generate a number that's a that's just a you know floating point number that tells me how similar they are to one another. You're 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 putting them into uh you know you know multi uh vector space. Mm -hmm. And then I'm doing the same thing with the question. So I'm asking a question up here, and, and forgive me for the interface. Obviously, this is this is RD, this isn't our actual software. Um, what is the population of this drug across all papers? Now, that's a really challenging question for AI because there isn't enough context within GPT-4. It cannot, you know, hold all of our papers in working memory. Um, and it will attempt to answer that question. So I'm taking all of those chunks of the PDF. I'm trying to compare where this question, maybe maybe that drug exists within the PDF. I'm calculating all those embeddings. And then I'm uh, handing it this huge chunk of text. And I'm asking it to, to summarize that text. And its answer is the specific population of size of patients with the drug, this drug, across all papers, not explicitly mentioned. Uh, however, one of the studies does mention this particular population, and it pulls that little bit out. And it can cite that particular, uh, you know, that particular source as well, which is nice. But it's not there yet, right? Because one of the problems is with GPT-4 is that limited context window. It's roughly 3,000 words with, with the lower model. Uh, there are there's a larger model that can get more context into it, but without a larger working memory, it's not able to to really make a lot of those you know human level conclusions where a human were to read this, extract that information, and then and then make sense of it after the fact. Right? That's a multi step process, and so to expect an AI to do that in a, in a zero shot basis it is a tall order, and it's definitely something we'll have to continue experimenting with over here at NK. Uh, because because it's it's not there yet, and so we will not publish something, or we will not put it into our software as a feature until we're confident that it can actually deliver the results we're looking for. Amazing stuff! Um, absolutely fascinating, uh, and it's quite nice to see you know how how quickly uh, companies like like yourselves have started to lean into this new technology. I mean, it feels like it's just the other day that uh, ChatGPT and GPT four sort of. Uh, came on the scene and it, it also feels like within minutes, you know, you guys leaned in and sort of said, okay, how do we incorporate this into what it is that we're doing? And I, I'm certainly very excited about that. And I of course have used nested knowledge in, in lit reviews that I've done and loved it. Um, I sorry, Kevin. Jump in quickly, Greg, we have so many comments uh, and questions flowing in. I'm loving these. I, there are a couple that might cross both Pico portal and, and nested knowledge. So I'd love to surface some of them quickly. You want to uh, jump in now? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just, just to knock out a couple of them. I know that we have a question and answer later, but yeah. uh, one of the questions was actually directly on, on the demo we just showed, where do those PDFs come from? So most of these are going to be their open access, which we import automatically. And I'm sure Pico portal has uh, open access uh, access as well. The rest are uploaded by you into the software. So that's how we do it. And I'm sure Pico portal does similarly. And uh, another question is, what is the databases these come from? And I also wanted to give Pico Portal an opportunity to answer this and not just give it for us, but an answer for us is we have direct API access to PubMed, to clinicaltrials.gov, to uh, uh, the director of open access journals and the European version of PubMed called Europe PMC. Uh, but we can also take imports. So if you have MBase searches are similar. And Eitan, if you want to jump in and talk about database access and PDF access, I'm sure that those uh, are I think it's the same. I, I think that it's, you know, we support over 20 different, you know, file formats and, and sources. So uh, there's nothing that will prevent you from uh, uploading information. 
Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Uh, any other questions you want to lean into now, Kevin or oh, Jeff? Or... A lot of these are on uses for systematic review and such, but since those were on what we were showing, I didn't want to sort of leave those questions hanging. Uh, but Jeff, is there anything else on on this that you want to bring up before we hand it over to Riaz? No, let's dive into it. Amazing. Okay, well, Thanks, everyone, uh, for the engagement. And Riaz, over to you. Riaz, what we're going to ask you, Riaz, to do is talk about GPT-4 and how it might be used in the context of LitReview. Um, and over to you, Riaz. Great. All right. Thank you very much. So there'll be a little bit more jumping around on my screen. Hopefully you can all see this at the moment, uh, my PowerPoint. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, to address this uh, first off is why are we doing this in the first place, right? <laughs> so we, we uh, Pico Portal, being an AI-assisted company um, for systematic reviewing, um, earlier in the year when ChatGPT was sort of really taking off, we were curious as to what are the capabilities currently, what were the capabilities then um, of these large language models in terms of what they could do for systematic reviewers. And so we hosted a webinar uh, that was attended by a similar amount of people where I think we're at 369 participants at the moment. So um, lots of interest worldwide. Uh, and we just ran through a bunch of systematic review tasks, things from developing a search question to uh, developing a search strategy. Um, and we wanted to see what it could do. There's lots of good conversation and excitement and definitely a lot of apprehension as well, which you know I think we addressed in a paper that we published in Systematic Reviews about this. But overall, everybody wanted to see what would come next, sort of wanted to see if we revisit these kinds of things the next six months, um, how would the systems be looking? How would they be performing? So what we know the system did well uh, when we asked it, being a large language model, it is very capable, of course, at uh, discerning context and then writing things. So asking it to assess and describe PICO elements for a question or workshopping review questions, drafting eligibility criteria, even sort of blanket choosing relevant titles for a given question without any manual training, uh, just based on the titles of, of papers, it did quite well in that. What it didn't do well um, was creating a PubMed search strategy, uh, consistently providing real citations to support claims, um, accurately summarizing papers, uh, and creating error-free code for analyses. These are things where there's the generative capabilities of the large language models comes into play a little bit more. And um, you can see an issue called hallucination where the AI just in his predictive model thinks of something that should fit that isn't actually um, you know, truthful necessarily. So we wanted to run this again and just test these four tasks and see how uh, how it's performing now in terms of these things. So first up um, is create a PubMed query for a systematic review uh, using keywords and mesh terms. We're just going to use the same search strategy that we did back in February. And the issue that this one had last time was it was making up mesh terms. And it doesn't have access to the mesh database. Uh, and so it, it, it's going to come up with things that it thinks it should, should use. Uh, but we will see what it does this time. So this time, chocolate as a mesh flavonoids, flavanones, cacao. So interesting. So before, previously, it used cocoa as the mesh, which is incorrect. Cacao is correct. Um, and I believe flavonoids is the correct mesh term as well. I don't know if flavanones is, but we can check that quickly just to spot check. Um, and the interesting thing here, right, is that because you are working with, uh, you can work with it and train it. So that is, a, that is a proper mesh term. Okay, so that's appropriate. Then that's not bad. Uh, it didn't make up mesh terms, at least from those first couple checking ones that it used to make up. Um, but the other thing is that you can correct it, right? So if it gives you something that's incorrect, um, then you can you can ask it to revise based on something. So where that does apply, we can see here it added a filter for study type, uh, and that 
doesn't look like a validated trial filter. It's it's sort of come up with one that that might work. That might be something that you know somebody who doesn't know about validated filters might use. But if we pull a validated Cochrane trial filter and we tell it to use this instead, study type should be a validated filter. Uh, don't have to use politeness with it, but <laughs> sometimes I still catch myself. <laughs> um, filters can be validated study filter, uh, replace the study type concept with the following filter from Cochrane. I didn't actually send it. No, it's thinking. That's why I can't get in there. Don't know. Oh, did it find it on its own? Randomized or placebo or drug therapy or randomly or trial or groups. So it came close actually to to the one. Um, but the point is there, you can, you can train it to, you can train it even in a session, um, to fine tune, uh, your strategy. So, um, the one aspect, uh, that is still true, I think from before is you do have to have that expertise, uh, a little bit to understand what's potentially incorrect and then dive in. But it seems that it has gotten a little bit better for that task. So the next task was summarizing. So we're going to ask it to summarize three different abstracts. Um, <clears throat> sorry, Riaz, do you want to yes. just maybe copy the code and pop it into PubMed and see what kind of results we're going to get? Oh, sure. It's a good idea. Ah, that's the, that is, is that the correct code? That is the code. I think 702, uh, which is a little bit low, but again, you could fine tune it. Uh, I might expect closer to, from having done my own search on this topic, closer to, you know, one to 2000, um, but 700 might be a good starting point. And then you can fine tune. Um, you could find some uh, studies that, you should hope to see and expect to see and use them as indexing and find out uh, if they're included in that search or not. And then ask um, ask it to refine the search to include the kinds of terms that will return those records. Uh, so we have three different abstracts here. Copy, shift, shift. Okay, let's see what it does for summarizing the three studies. So it's already taken a different approach than it did previously. Uh, previously, it sort of um, took one small paragraph uh, that summarized what across all three here it is broken down across a little bit more specifics for each of the sections in the quotations, which is helpful for if you're trying to actually check um, check the accuracy. So of course, further large scale and longer term studies are required. That's a fairly standard uh, recommendation with any any kind of research question. Um, 
But just a quick check of what it pulled from each of the studies. So the issue that this had done earlier in the year was that it sometimes confused things from the background with results and vice versa. Uh, so if we check that first one, we can see that they had 44 adults, patients randomized for 18 weeks. Um, Patients randomized for 18 weeks, 6.3 grams, 44 adults, and then significant reduction in systolic and diastolic blood pressure, no change in other biomarkers. There is a reduced systolic blood pressure, diastolic, without changes in biomarkers, other markers here. So that looks okay. Study two, we have 22 adults, uh, 49 grams a day for eight weeks, and then no significant effect on 24-hour resting. 22 adults, uh, eight-week period, reduced the intake. That was correct. And previously, daily consumption, no effect on 24-hour blood pressure. So that's correct. And then study three, 42 hypertensives, um, 2.5 grams a day or cocoa-free capsules for 12 weeks, no improvement uh, in blood pressure, glucose metabolism, lipids, or body weight. And here we have 42 hypertensives, 2.5 grams a day for 12 weeks, did not affect blood pressure, glucose metabolism, the same thing. So that is, that's better. Um, it didn't take things from before, uh, from the background and intuit them as incorrectly as results. Uh, and then the recommendation that it made from that is that it might, might have an effect, but benefits are less clear um, in some other, other populations. And of course, this is just from three uh, abstracts. So looking at the full text might give something different. Um, but that's, it's, I think it has shown an improvement in what it was doing earlier in the year. Um, I have a question for you. Did you ask for yeah. a recommendation or did it suggest it on its own? I did ask for a recommendation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other, another aspect that we tested was the citations because of it, these systems sometimes hallucinate. Uh, if you ask it to provide citations, uh, it might provide ones that aren't real, that don't exist. Uh, so I wanna test that again, and let's see if we ask it for five citations, is it going to provide real citations for us? And of course, how does it, um, how does it answer the uh, pretty complicated methodological prompt about heterogeneity So it's good, it's given measures of quantitative heterogeneity and how to handle different options. I think I'm recognizing most of those papers. Recognize the first one and Deeks, um, then Michael Borenstein's introduction to meta analysis. Um, let's just check this one and the last one as well, and we can see if they are correct. How should meta analysis be undertaken? Yeah. And uncertainty as in heterogeneity estimates in meta-analyses. Yanides, Pastopoulos, Evangelo. Good, okay, so that's that's good. That is definitely an improvement as well. Um, I think you should still check, you know, if you ask it for references, you should still check to see if they are real, but I think uh, the fact that it gave real ones is definitely a improvement uh, on on what it was doing before. Um, and then the last thing we Sorry, want to I, check. I just want to add one yeah. more thing. I mean, I think when you ask for citation, you should also ask for DOI 
because it's it's a unique identifier and that would be almost binary to make sure that this is the right citation so would be a quick check yes yeah yeah, yeah. um because it is possible that's correct there's possible that some of the aspects of the uh, exact citation might not be correct. I didn't check that, but uh, at least these papers um, and the authors seem correct from from a glance here. Uh, the last thing that we wanted to check is how it works for um, asking it to code. So I have quite a complex prompt here for writing a meta-analysis. I want to write a program for Python that uses meta-analysis to find an average effect, uh, relative risk um, for so a binary outcome for intervention versus comparator from three studies, plot the individual and overall estimates uh, and 95% confidence intervals in a forest plot. And then I'm asking for more details. I want on the left side of the plot uh, to have a table with four columns, numbers of events and participants in each arm, and three rows for these specific studies. Uh, I want those to be aligned with the study labels. And then on the right side of the plot, I want to include the point estimates and 95% confidence intervals for each study in the overall estimate. That's a very, that, that's what a standard, how I would describe a standard forest plot uh, looking like. And it's very complex. It has to interpret all of that correctly. Um, we, the issue that we had previously when we asked it to do something similar is that there were some errors in the code and it wasn't able to correct those itself. It needed um, some knowledge of, of the coding language to actually go in, find the error and correct it. Uh, so this will be interesting to see if it's able to write this without error um, and if it does have an error, if it can fix it or not. It does provide some comments in the code as well. So that's helpful. Especially if you were to take this and then work with it and try and develop it further. So let's see what it does. We're going to copy this code to Google Collaboratory. Okay. And then copy this code. Now let's see what happens. Hopefully no errors. Oh, there's an error. Okay, so it says there's an error in line Three. So let's see if we can fix that. Let's see if not we, but ChatGPT can fix that because I wouldn't know where to start. I'm not a Python coder. Part of the trick in working with this is how to ask ChatGP to do, to fix things and to give you what you want. Um, there's an error. Line three as shown below. Let's see if it can give a correction to the code. Going to maybe try and fix the whole code there. Let's run that first bit in the meantime. Uh, 
Yeah, no, it didn't give me the point estimates on the right side. That's okay. We will see. Maybe it knows its limitations. Or maybe I could have asked it differently. Um, so new code. Let's try that and see if that works. Nope, an import error there as well. So, okay, so this is good, but it's interesting. So it's not giving me exactly, uh, there are some errors that need to be workshopped and that is that is important to know. Um, so there has to be some, some expertise still in terms of coding, but it does create a framework for you to, to possibly start. These are of course the kinds of things, if you were going to do a meta-analysis, you probably wouldn't use <laughs> Python to do so, uh, you would use a different program, Stata, R, SAS, um, you know, there are programs on the internet as well. Um, but uh, this was as an exercise to see how it codes is interesting. So uh, I will stop sharing. Those are the four tasks that we had it to do. I think my takeaway from that is that you do still need um, some expertise. You can't just, just trust it uh, blindly in terms of of things, um, you know, it can't handle all of your problems, but it is a, a good starting point and a tool very clearly. Thanks very much, Riaz. Actually, that that was fascinating. Um, and as I'll, I'll, I'll describe myself as an amateur coder, um, I, I watched that with absolute fascination. I work with R and I, I love coding and uh, watching GPT just generate code like that is um, it's just mind blowing. Um, the next question is really going to be for Etan, and and the question is going to be, what is the Pico Portal roadmap for using GPT going forwards? But before you jump in there, are there any other questions popping up in the Q and A that anybody wants to jump in on and address? Otherwise, we can go back to Etan. Okay, I'm yeah, going to so, just, Oh, I, I would just say I, I'm seeing Jeff, a lot yeah. of confusion and and worry about uh, copyright, which I think is a totally valid concern. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and I think part of this is handled by open AI's own terms of use, right? So, so technically speaking, whether you're using it here in the way that Riaz is, is doing with, with just GPT in the browser, or if you're using it, um, uh, through the API, like inside of nested knowledge or inside of Pico portal, um, then, then you should look at the open AI, uh, you know, policies as to how they are agreeing to use that data. I can speak for sure for the API. If you're uploading, you know, non-open access, full text, um, those will not be used for uh, training purposes, which means that you can safely do so. Um, however, right, so so the, the only thing about that is there, there are still sort of cons security concerns anytime you use a web app. Like there, anytime you're uploading information into the internet, um, hypothetically, that could get hacked. But, um, you know, and, and, or, you know, could, there could be some sort of, sort of hack at that point, but, um, these are the tools we rely on every day. So, so you sort of, you live with that risk, I think is the way to think about it. Yeah. Yeah. I can I also quick. comment quickly that when it comes to actually just putting your full text into the platform, I know that I saw concerns there. Uh, Nest and I believe Pico portal is going to be covered under similar exemptions as say an EndNote library or as a box library. But if you're concerned about open AI, just don't use it. Uh, in our software, there's a simple, uh, you have to, you actually have to turn it on. So you have to opt into open AI, mm -hmm. just leave it off. Uh, if you have concerns on the legal side with open AI's policy. Uh, but if you're just sharing with your collaborators in the platform, that should be no problem on Pico and that should be no problem on nested as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I just saw, I saw as Jeff did about a dozen questions on that topic. And I think it's good to so, address. Super but, interesting questions, super interesting yeah. and, and good to address them. Thanks very much guys. Yeah. Um, so Greg and Eitan, back to you. It's on over to you, uh, the Pico Portal roadmap for using GPT. Yeah, so I, I would just say since the inception of, of Pico Portal, we're not strange to AI. I mean, it was as a biomedical AI company, we we developed the platform uh, with, with AI in mind. But I think that we, we see and what we will continue to see is that AI will touch every aspect of every process that is on the mm. platform. I don't envision anything else, like from the point where you create a protocol up to the point that you create your manuscript and everything in, in between will be uh, pieces of the technology that will assist you along the way. And by doing that, 
uh, basically re reducing the timeline. So really, of course, you know what I what I kind of share with with our team is is respect and suspect, which really means, you know, we have to respect the AI. I mean, it really does some some magics, you know, but we have to be uh, suspicious as well, and we don't have to, yeah. you know, it's so convincing, you know, uh, sometimes, especially when it gives you like this extra element that uh, explains something that you tend to agree with it, you know, even though it might not be right. So you have to always double check yourself definitely at this stage. Uh, but as I said, this time will move on. I, I think that that's what we will see. Uh, it, it, it is quite fascinating. And, and um, it's quite nice to be talking to people that have got such a, like a sort of a positive view of the future. Um, notwithstanding the extent to which you guys have already leaned into this, but you've got this attitude of obviously going forwards, every aspect of what we're going to do, uh, where there's an opportunity to, we're going to use the power of AI. So I think that that's really exciting. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, more and more of this. Um, I think let's probably lean into the Q and A at this point because I think there's 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 sure. a whole lot of questions in there, and I think if the four of you can just kind of find questions and jump right in and and start responding, because I think there's there's a, there's a ton of them. I'll look for them as well. So jump right in, Kevin. I can see you you raring to go. Yes, I've been. Thank you guys for <laughs> these amazing questions. I just can't keep up with them. Uh, so just knocking off a couple that I think are important. Uh, there was a question on how do we get articles from post 2021? The chat GPT data set is limited to that and before. Uh, I think that the clear thing to, to recognize here is that when you are doing your research on top of uh, uh, open AI in something like nested knowledge, you're providing the articles. So, or, or open access, we have an open access integration that can pull them in, but you are going to be uh, uh, looking at those. The chat GPT data set for using the native is going to be more limited. Uh, I think that's where you might need to, I, uh, I, uh, take uh, some of these limitations we're discussing with a grain of salt. Certainly those search strings that Riaz generated could be run and then it would find articles from even later. But uh, the GPT native won't have access to those articles unless you were to provide them. So that's okay. a great question from Corinne. Kevin, uh, while you're talking, Kevin, there's a question from Rebecca and can I just throw it at you and you can respond. Okay, so Rebecca asks, with all of the training and fine tuning needed, does using AI to generate PubMed queries actually save time? Why not just use a human expert, use human experts that do? That is a great question. And I think this is, so we actually did a similar test to Riaz way back when ChatGPT came out and we were not that impressed with its search capabilities. So my answer really is actually, AI is not there yet on the search strategy. I think your human librarian is still gonna outperform, but on the next yeah. stages. Yeah, I think, yeah. I, think I, I agree with that. I think um, it's an interesting, um, topic area though because searching is one thing that is actually highly structured right it is something that uses logic um it uses uh dictionaries for terms um and those are quite standardized and so it is an area where i think with the right um you know concentration of development uh, I think that's an area where, you know, these language models could be used to search quite efficiently. Um, you know, if they were told to only, if they're given access and told to only pull mesh terms from the mesh database, if they were then told to use um, uh, keywords uh, as different synonyms and things that fit and, you know, sort of use their capabilities in that regards for those. Um, I think it's an area where there could be quite, could be very powerful, but uh, because it's not built that way yet, um, it, it's still using more generative side and uh, needs needs fine tuning definitely. Okay, another super interesting question by William Litton and um, Jeff. You might be a good person to lean into this or, or others. Um, William asks: To what extent might language models trained with biomedical specific text, for example, PubMed databases, outperform general models like GPT-4 on literature review tasks? Now this this could honestly be a whole webinar in and of itself, and I think maybe maybe the Pico portal could people could speak to this as well because I think there's different philosophies maybe happening here. In nested knowledge, we we believe very firmly that one of the strengths of our platform is the ability for the user to come in and structure their own ontology. Why is that? Well, it's it's I think a huge part of it is because. Mesh is rather broad. And so sometimes, oftentimes, when you are, you know, delving into something that's truly novel, truly new, 
you're doing a systematic review that, that has never been done, right? Like you're 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 the first person to collate some of this evidence. Um, that is not well documented in in mesh. Like the mesh librarians do, do a great job. Like they, they do their absolute best to create this this ontology that reflects the body of human thought. But there's only so much granularity to to that to that hierarchy, right? And so when you're exploring something that's new, it's really important that the user determine, hey, here is my ontology. Here is here is the way in which these concepts are related to one another. And you're expressing that in a series of is a uh, relationships, right? So, you know, this particular drug is a uh, uh, you know an intervention, right? And you're telling uh, yourself and you, the rest of your research team that these concepts are related. Of course, with this new layer, this this recent layer of of LLMs, this 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 these like GPT four, right? Um, GPT four can take a look at that is a relationship for your entire ontology, taking it in at a glance, and also do some classification on top of that and realize, hey, this term that the user has defined, they're, they're saying this, this term is important. What is that semantically similar to inside of the article? And that's the next layer that that adds a lot of time savings and, and accuracy to, to and, and just, just, just overall raw speed to, the, to, the, to that person's project, right? So you're defining what's important. Um, and, then, and then you're telling the AI, here are the relationships here are the concepts that I find really important. Please extract them from the underlying literature. And that's where all of that speed comes from, I think. Um, yeah, I but but I might be, that's just my philosophy. So so Ed, I want to hear from uh, you guys. What, what yeah. you guys yeah, I, I, uh, so, so let me just uh, kind of share with the group what's going on. Um, when you have a platform like uh, Pick a Portal or Nested Knowledge, we really are not using the uh, GPT as the source of knowledge. This is not how we're using it. You know, when it says that it's trained till 2021, it's basically trained to understand text, to guess text, to figure out like uh, uh, this syntax of a text, but we're not using it as a source of knowledge. You know, this is not the intent. The source of knowledge will be always you. You will be the one to instruct the software what to do, and it will use its abilities to go ahead and to do it to the best of their ability in order for you to uh, in order for you to receive your um, your answer. So I would not be so concerned with it 2021 because if you're asking it for something, you know, like Riaz did when Riaz asked, uh, "Can you find for me, you know, the the citation?" Yeah, obviously it will not find citations that are post. 2021. But if we would do it, we will provide it with the list of citations, you know, we'll tell it like to sift through it. As an example, I'm not saying it's a realistic example, but as an example, you basically, you are the source of knowledge, right? I mean, we as the users, right? That's just the engine that help us sift through it. I think that's an excellent way to put it. Um, yeah. The only thing I would add to just try to address the original question, you know, as you're saying, you're imparting or, or the, the model when it's trained has been imparted certain abilities, right? So the question I think is, hey, what if you show it medical literature? Does that impart a certain ability um, beyond that of, of, of you know, something that's been trained more generally? And, and so far, it seems to be that there's more to what goes on behind the scenes. Like to some extent, these models that we're interfacing with are black boxes. And so we don't know exactly how AI, I mean, that's a trade secret for them, right? We don't know exactly how OpenAI has trained their models, but in our initial testing, at least, it seems like GPT-4 has currently some sort of leg up. Now, in, in the next six months, maybe maybe Google will release a, a new version of Palm that's been trained on, on medical literature and seems to have um, more of GPT-4's logical inferencing capabilities. I would love to see that happen, and I welcome that arms race because that's good for all yeah. of us, right? Um but yeah, it's it's an interesting question, and and I I don't I can't fully answer why GPT four seems to be good at certain types of tasks. Well, something that seems to be trained on more of that type of literature that we're dealing with every day um, mm -hmm. doesn't seem to be able to answer those same questions. Interesting, interesting. So another interesting question, and I, I hope I get your name right, uh, Marina Chilov. Okay, so while. AI is mostly used to generate things to be later curated by humans. Can you use it for testing human created searches, for example, for errors and omissions 
or for testing AI created works, errors and emissions? And I, I like that question, especially in the context of uh, Riaz, what you did earlier in terms of getting GPT-4 to check an error. And I mean, is is this something we can be doing in the context of lit review, generate a search, get AI to check it and uh, and give, it, give us the once over? I don't, I don't have a particular person in mind to answer that. Maybe just jump in whoever thinks they've got a Riaz, is that mostly for you? you yeah, yeah, it's, um, I don't know. You still probably want an expert <laughs> to look at things um, because uh, I was just uh, in the background trying to get it to fix the error code um, again and again, and it just kept giving me different lines, um, you know, that should have fixed the problem, but didn't. Um, so sometimes it's possible that it gets stuck and doesn't recognize what it's doing is wrong. Um, I wouldn't. I probably, until it gets better, I probably would not have it check your work uh, in 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 regards when there's like facts kind of thing. You can have it check your writing, right? As a language model, it's very good at writing. And uh, I think one of the probably good uses that it has is if you want to uh, improve your writing or check the grammar or uh, reframe something, you know, give it give it a section of text and ask it to revise. Um, and so that's, you know, that's possible. Even truncates, you know, down, uh, you're having that difficulty getting your abstract uh, for submission from 600 words down to 400, you know, it might be able to help with that as well. Um, but uh, I would say for fine checking uh, of um, facts and those kinds of things, I, I would not trust it to do that for you. Um, I would I would have yourself do that, or you know, an expert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, a lovely question from Trevor Riley, and I think this will probably go to both Nested Knowledge and and Pico Portal. From Trevor asks, interesting in understanding how both. Pico Portal and Nested Knowledge is developing these products. What type of consultations have you done with research libraries? There are definitely ways that these tools could support further processes. So consultation with research libraries. Um, I don't know who wants to go first, yeah, but I think it's a great question. First, and I'll go second. Yeah, so we're in discussion actually with uh, some arms of um, like government sponsored organization to go ahead and to figure out how to use those kind of technologies and look at interoperability as well. So, so there are um, there are the conversations started as we speak right now. I mean, there's more and more interest, and I think that that's that's where we're at right now. It's more of a conversation than actual uh, something that it's happening. Great. And at Nested Knowledge, uh, actually, one of our earliest investors and one of our earliest collaborators was a group called the ECRI Institute. They have a, uh, I actually know, they have 17 full-time librarians that are doing everything from horizon scanning to systematic literature review. And we built some of our tools based on their recommendations. So we have something that's very similar to the Carrot 2 tool, uh, which is a fuzzy topic modeling AI. Um, that's actually when we figured out that we should include a Pico tool. Uh, so we've consulted with uh, them and then a couple of other libraries. But I will note that university librarians are this font of ability and knowledge. And I think there's another comment in there other than Trevor's that said, how are you going to leverage libra librarians' knowledge to make AI better? Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a wonderful question because, uh, or, or really a comment, because I think there's so much more that we could drive, not just on the nested knowledge side, listening to librarians about what tools should be made available, but also getting better at training, right? Because uh, uh, we do train. Um, when when you when you use our software, we try to train on what you're what you're inputting. So you are fed some search terms of interest. You pick your final search strategy, and we'd like to learn from from how you do so. But we can only do so very incrementally and slowly by just like each user coming in. So I think there's a, a tremendous opportunity to collaborate more, and I think it takes an actual conversation with some librarians. We are very open, um, and Jeff has actually done a whole lot of outreach to university librarians, and we're very happy to get other suggestions in other than those tools uh, uh, that we've already brought in by those library suggestions. So really, I think the same as Pico Portal, we're very open to conversations about other tools. And we've built this to try to to try to try replicate some of those capabilities while fully recognizing that right now, search strategy is definitely one of those things that's in the human bucket. That's how any software yeah. platform grows, right? Whether it's Pico Portal, Nest Knowledge, another one, we rely on our users to tell us what they want. And, and that's that's just part of, the, part of how it works. Yeah. Okay. yeah, and we definitely have worked with um, 
we, we you know consulted with several librarians uh, at different institutions at multiple points over the development just to make sure that we're getting um, the right kind of perspectives. Very good. I, uh, great answers. An interesting question from Patricia, Patricia F. Anderson. Um, if people are not experts in searching, and I, I put myself into that bucket, that's why I like the question. I, I do searches, but I don't think of myself as an expert because it's not part of my day job ordinarily. How would they identify large language model errors um, in, in generating search strategies? So for the, if you imagine me as a test case and I'm doing a search, I'm using an LLM, uh, what strategies would you suggest that I use to make sure that what's being generated on my behalf isn't full of errors and isn't um, absolute bunk. Um, and I don't, if I suppose anybody could jump in on that, I think it's a great question and I, I'd be interested to hear what you guys have to say. So I would say, I think that it's, it's wrong to consider, you know, a platform like this as the expert mm -hmm. at this point, right? Mm -hmm. What you can do is to improve something is to tell it to assume a persona. So you can say, I'm a highly qualified librarian, right? And I would like to do that. Then, you know, miraculously, GPT will take that persona that you're telling it, and it will start to think, quote unquote, like that particular person, right? So, so you can do that. But I think that it's not at a point that I would say that if you're not an expert, you know, you cannot assume that uh, the technology will replace an expert. It, it's not there. Yeah, yeah, did right, absolutely. And I think the likes of me need to make sure that I'm good friends with a human expert as well. <laughs> uh, I'll be I'll be on the phone with 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 the four of you, uh, getting help when I need it. Uh, no, I think that's a fair answer, and I think that probably underlines the sort of principles that you guys have all been uh, alluding to throughout the talk. Um, another question from anonymous. Uh, do you have concerns about journals or publishers banning the use of AI when conducting a systematic review? Yeah, so let me let me Ted, let me start. So here's what I'm kind of preaching. I think that what it's critical for us to be totally transparent when we use the technology. I mm -hmm. think it's fair to use the technology. I mean, it does save time. But I think that we do need to mention that the technology is being used and where it was used. So that there is transparency to what we're doing. I would obviously would not never submit a paper that it's totally generated by an AI. I think that if you do that, you have to say that the author is, is GPT-4. But, but if you're if you're using it like for to develop your search strategy or your protocol or or to help you with the manuscript. I think that you should mention that we used uh, GPT to assist us with this, so that we we have a we have a record. The reason that I'm saying it, the the difference between like human versus uh, AI, I think that the boundary started to blur, you know, and it's it's quite scary, really is scary from that perspective where you cannot tell not not just just with GPT, but any other uh, AI that are being used for to generate pictures, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that it's it's critical, um, if not should be a mandate, in my opinion, that someone should stamp something that it was generated by AI. Okay. Look, I think uh, I would. So, sorry. Oh, can I just add on one last yep, thing? I, I would. I would totally agree with everything Atan just said. Um, the only thing I would add is that publishers are not a monolith, right? So the equivalent to that statement would be, you know, after the invention of the printing press, what happens if publishers ban the printing press, right? Like, like, okay, or, or, you know, a monastery out of all of the monasteries bans the printing press in order to preserve the jobs of all their scribes. Uh, you know, that that's not going to, that's not going to work. The, the, a better question is how do we ensure that we are transparent in our methods? And, and so I wouldn't worry so much about, even regulatory bodies going and saying you can't use AI. The question is, how do we use AI responsibly? Um, how do we make sure that we are transparent in those methods? And that's what Etan is, is talking about. So, so I'm not I'm not super worried about losing access to tools. The question is, what? How do tools change the game? Right. But to your yeah. point, you know, there are universities that are forcing their students right now to submit things on pen and pa pen and paper, right? So they said, you know, we will not accept it as electronic because we don't know where it's coming from. 
but if you're writing it, at least we we're somewhat sure that that it's you, you know. So well, I, I had this conversation with um, one of the professors at a local university here in Dublin who was concerned about, well, you know, the, the students are going to be using GPT to create essays. And my response was, well, for some of the essays, you should make it compulsory. You know, th- this is a tool that they are going to be using in the future, and you should be teaching them how to use it to produce the best outputs. And uh, and it's not a matter of just putting in, like, please write an essay on the history of public health, because the more you put into the prompt, the better the outcome you're going to get. And you can't, you will have students that do a better and worse job. And it's worth the universities leaning in to teaching people how to do, uh, you know, high quality prompt engineering. Anyway. With that, I'm going to say thanks very much to everyone on the panel. I think this has been one of the more interesting conversations I've had in ages. So thank you very much. You guys have really uh, come out swinging with absolutely fascinating gems. Um, I am once again excited about Lit Review and ready to lean in and do one. Thanks for your time. Any any uh, final last words, anything anyone wants to end off with? Um, I Just see consider- Kevin's hand is up. Jump in there, Kevin. There are so many good questions here that I think that uh, uh, more webinar content is probably necessary here. And there was even a question, um, Eitan, directly for you, thanking you for the webinar. Uh, they know that you did one six months ago and they were interested in coming back for this one. So Eitan, can we expect another update on this webinar in a couple months time? I think so. I think that we, we're ourselves interested. Greg, what do you think? Love it. Absolutely love it. I will do as many of these as you want, because to me, this has been a lot of fun. Um and uh, and we're going to get this video up on YouTube. You guys, you know, uh, you'll just find it doing a search for AI and Lit Review. It'll be on my channel. Uh, that's uh, uh, Global Health with Greg Martin. But we'll also stick it on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. We're going to get this all over the place and certainly do another one in the future. Thanks for your time, guys. Thanks, everybody, for leaning in and watching. Thanks for the great questions. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, have a nice day. Don't do drugs. Always do your best. Don't ever change. Speak to you soon. High five. Bye-bye.